Welcome to the invited talk session on quantum computing. My name is Scott Pakin, and I'm serving as session chair. I work as a computer scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory and have been dabbling in quantum computing for about six years. I'm therefore looking forward to hearing what our two distinguished speakers have to say about this exciting new technology and its role in high performance computing. Our first talk will be given by Professor Crystal Michelson. Professor Michelson is the group leader of the Quantum Information Processing Group at the Ulrich Supercomputing Center and Professor of Quantum Information Processing at RWTH Aachen University. Her research interests range from classical simulations of electrodynamics and quantum mechanics to quantum computing and quantum computing architectures. Professor Michelson and her group have ample experience in performing large-scale simulations of quantum systems. With her group and a team of international collaborators, she set the world record in simulating a quantum computer with 48 qubits. In 2019, she participated in a research collaboration that proved Google's quantum supremacy result. She has been building up the Unified Infrastructure for Quantum Computing, or UNIQUE, at the Supercomputing Center. The title of Professor Michelson's talk is Integrating Quantum and High-Performance Computers for Practical Quantum Computing and concerns the Yulish Supercomputing Center's strategy for quantum computing and its role in an HPC environment. Please welcome Professor Crystal Michelson. So Europe has a long-standing tradition of excellence in quantum research, and this reaches from the foundations of quantum theory to theoretical expertise in quantum information processing. And this long-standing tradition has led to this year's Nobel Prize in Physics being awarded to two Europeans, Alain Aspect and Anton Zeilinger, and one American, John Clauser, for their separate but still related research employing laboratory experiments on entangled quantum states. And this lays the foundations for the emergence of quantum technologies. And one example of these quantum technologies is quantum computing. Quantum computing has a large potential. We have quite some group, and it's a diverse user group, coming from science and industry. And they have various hard computational challenges to unravel complex systems. As examples of use cases in quantum computing, we can think of quantum simulations. Where is this important? This is important in quantum chemistry. So design of materials, design of um, medicaments. We also have optimization. And optimization we have everywhere. We have to optimi optimize traffic. One has optimization in the financial world and so on. And since optimization is a part of uh, machine learning, we also have as an application quantum machine learning. But let me first explain a little bit more what a quantum computer is. And the building block of a quantum computer is one qubit. Now, one qubit is a two-state quantum system. And here you see how this is represented. We have two basis states, zero and one, which can also correspond to a spin up and a spin down. The state of uh, such a qubit is written down as a linear combination of these two basis states with two coefficients, A0 and A1, and they are complex number which satisfy the um, condition that the sum of the squares of the absolute values of the coefficients has to be one. Now, this is called a superposition. If one measures a qubit, we do not have this 
we, what one could call infinite um, information that be, can be stored, because if you measure, one always gets as an answer a zero or a one. Of course, it's easy to extend now our computer with one qubit, which is actually not a computer, because for a computer you need at least two, otherwise one cannot compute. So if we extend this, we have four basis states. And then, of course, again, we have a similar condition for these uh, complex coefficients. In general, the state of this two qubit system is different from a product of the states of the single qubit systems. And because this is so, we say these are entangled states. So we have entanglements if the state of the two qubit or even many qubit system cannot be written as a product state. And a simple example of an entangled state, and in quantum physics it's actually the um, maximum entangled state, it's a singlet state. And you can see from the formula how this uh, looks like. From two qubits, we can easily go to L qubits, and you can see what we then have is a storage possibility for two to the power L numbers. And again, this is our superposition. What we can also do, we can carry out operations on these two to the power L numbers simultaneously. And it's assumed that um, we can carry out such an operation in one operation. So we can have a matrix operating on our state of the system, a unitary matrix, we get a new state, and the assumption is that we can do this matrix vector multiplication in one operation. So this means we have massive parallelism. In other words, quantum mechanics allows computers to calculate faster. And that is what it's all about. Now, why is quantum computing so difficult in practice? Because that's what you read all about. It's not so easy to build a quantum computer that computes properly. So let us look at a simple example. We initialize our uh, quantum computer in a state where both spins are up. Then we create a singlet state, we will apply five times a C0 state, and we read it out. Now, here you see a small movie that shows what happens if we have an ideal quantum computer, just as quantum theory tells us. And you see, this is the end result. The first qubit is pointing down, and the other one is along the horizontal line. I now made a simulation of a real quantum device with two qubits, and I carry out the same algorithm. And here you will see what happens. First of all, you see that the movement of the qubits is much more complicated because now we are dealing with a real device, but you also see that the result is different. In other words, this real quantum computer did not work properly. Why is this? Because in theory, we can make or we can control our qubits. And if we control one of them, this one is staying in the same position. It's not moving. In a real quantum computer, this is different. If we do a, an operation on this one, this one is not sitting still, but it's rotating. And that's one of the reasons that we can see such effects. What do we need uh, to build a functional quantum computer? First of all, of course, we need hardware. And at the heart of the hardware is the quantum processor of the chip. That's not sufficient. We also need a complete quantum software stack, which consists of quantum control. We have quantum error correction, a compiler, interfaces for the users, and so on. But then having this is also not really enough. 
So the question is, if we have such a quantum computer and it's a component software stack, what are we going to do with this? So this means we have to think of algorithms and we also have to develop uh, use cases. So we have to de develop use cases and if we want to make it useful, we have to do this for various user communities that are coming from academia and industry. So in the end, uh, to come to a functional quantum computer, we need a close collaboration, first of all, between theory and experiments, but also between academia and uh, industry. What is our strategy at the Jülich Supercomputing Center? This is based on four pillars. First of all, we have modeling and emulation strategy, then a provision strategy, we integrate quantum computers in our HPC infrastructure, and we create a quantum computer user infrastructure. First pillar, modeling and the emulation strategy. If we have a quantum computer, we want to benchmark it. So it's essential that we have theoretical tools to validate the design of the physically realizable quantum processors. Then we can model and simulate the hardware. It's also important to implement algorithms on uh, these modeled quantum computers and test the performance of the algorithms. For this purpose, we have developed the Jülich Universal Quantum Computer Simulator, JUX, which, as was mentioned before, can simulate, uh, or, and this was a world record, 48 uh, qubit quantum computer. And it has been used to benchmark Sycamore. Uh, we have several flavors of JUX. It runs on CPUs, GPUs, on the laptop, to the biggest supercomputers that are around. The second pillar is the provision strategy. Now, in July, we started with a quantum annealer. This is an analog quantum computer, and we have a D-Wave machine of the newest generation, which means that we have a quantum annealer with more than 5,000 qubits. Now, this is an analog quantum computer with which one already can do some prototype uh, applications. There are use cases from industry that can be um, computed with this type of quantum computer. The second one uh, we will install is a so-called quantum simulator, and this is also a device, so it's not, an, uh, it's not a software. And the um, quantum simulator that we are going to install is a uh, device from the French startup Pasquale, and it has more than 100 uh, qubits, which are neutral uh, atoms. Then we are looking to expand um, our infrastructure with digital quantum computers. And here we are thinking in the direction of uh, trapped ion uh, qubits, and then we are talking about more than 10 qubits, but also superconducting uh, quantum computers with more than 25 qubits. So we host these, what is called production uh, systems, and um, if necessary, we also provide remote access to um, hardware that is still available in experimental labs. So it's not that we are only looking at commercial uh, devices, we are involved in many projects and then we provide remote access to the quantum computers in the experimental uh, labs. Then the third pillar is to integrate the quantum computer in the HPC infrastructure. I will show you later in the next slide why this is so important. 
So in Ulysses, we have what is called a modular supercomputer. It's a supercomputer that consists of different modules. We have module four, uh, which is mainly based on uh, CPUs, we, which is our cluster. We have a booster, which is uh, based on uh, GPUs. Then we have uh, some uh, data analytics uh, module. We have a storage system. And you can see we have two modules here, which are more exotic. One is for quantum computing, the other one is for neuromorphic computing. At the moment, we do not yet look into neuromorphic computing uh, too much, but the quantum module, we are very much expanding. So this modular supercomputing architecture allows us to more easily integrate such a quantum computer in the HPC uh, system and also in the workflows. Why is it so important to integrate a quantum computer in an HPC infrastructure? This is to come to practical uh, quantum computing. For a long time, it's our vision that a quantum computer will not be a universal computer. It will be a special purpose device. So if we want to come to practical quantum computing, we have to connect it with our HPC uh, systems. Is this already for production? No, not yet. Because our quantum computers, it's a very young technology. We see there are still uh, many problems or many challenges in letting them operate as they have to operate, but we have to start with this integration. We have to be ready before this technology becomes mature. If we have the quantum, connect, uh, qu quantum computer connected to the HPC system, then we can carry out hybrid quantum classical algorithms. And I will show you here a small result of a uh, problem which is called the tail assignment problem. The tail assignment problem is an optimization problem which comes from the aircraft industry. So the idea is to assign aircrafts, and they can be of different type, to flights, and then to minimize the overall costs. So it's not only the costs which are related to the airplanes, it's also the cost which is related to the personnel. And of course, our uh, quantum computers are small, the ones we can simulate or emulate on a supercomputer are bigger. At our place, we can simulate one with 42 qubits. So this means these large optimization problems that industry has, we have to simplify and make smaller. So we take a realistic problem, and this was actually in collaboration with Boeing. So we take an, a realistic problem and then, then simplify it. We made a problem which could be mapped onto a quantum optimization problem with 40 qubits. So it was a problem to find routes out of 472 flights between airports. And the goal was to find routes that do not overlap, because otherwise it's more costly. So for the simulation, we used JUX on uh, our modular supercomputer Jewels. And in the graph, you see the success rate of finding the solution as a number of qubits. We can do this, because it's a small optimization problem, so we know the exact outcome. And there is an algorithm which is called the quantum approximate optimization algorithm for gate-based quantum computers. And the results you see in this figure are the blue triangles. What do you learn from this curve? That you see that there is an exponential decrease, meaning that the larger the optimization problem becomes, the less probable it's that we find the solution and it's an exponential decrease. So this is not nice. 
as we are also developing algorithms, we are constantly looking into how can we improve the algorithms. And we found an approximate quantum annealing algorithm for the same quantum computer that still does not have a high success rate, but at least we got rid from this uh, exponential uh, decrease. The fourth uh, pillar was the quantum uh, user infrastructure. So here you see the uh, hexagon with uh, different elements of our Julius uh, Unified Infrastructure for Quantum Computing. It's a user facility for science and industry. So as I mentioned before, we have machines installed. We will, or we provide also remote access. We have them installed so that we can also operate them and then we provide access to users coming from uh, industry and academia in Europe. We develop algorithms and prototype applications together with our users. And from HPC, we know it's extremely important to provide users also with training and user support. We also do this for the quantum computers. And as we go for hybrid uh, usage, we do this for both, for HPC and uh, quantum together. The final goal is that this user infrastructure will be used for modular quantum HPC hybrid computing. And actually, as you see in this hexagon where we have the picture of the D-Wave quantum annealer, for the D-Wave quantum annealer, we have currently a rolling call, which means that a scientist can apply for machine time by writing a project proposal. This project proposal is then reviewed by experts and in the end the um, scientist is granted with machine time for one year. So we have here a peer reviewed access as we also have for our HPC uh, systems. So here you also see the variety. We have emulators that the users can make use of, so they can make use of chucks and also an Atos quantum learning machine. They can make use of uh, the D-Wave annealer, next year of the uh, Pascual quantum simulator, and then we also provide access to some experimental uh, systems. Now, in um, this Pasquale Quantum Simulator, that's a machine, it's a European machine, because we um, install it in the context of a Euro HPC joint undertaking uh, project. And um, this uh, makes together uh, with Unique that we are a first European hybrid HPC quantum computing uh, infrastructure, which is making the first steps into the direction of Euro QCS. And by the way, at the bottom of this slide, you see our new quantum computing uh, building, which has two machine holes. Now, what is Euro QCS? Euro QCS is a quantum computing and simulating infrastructure at European level. So the European Commission has the idea that we come to a federated infrastructure having several hosting sites um, of quantum computers and quantum simulators integrated with HPC systems. The idea of Euro QCS was for the first time mentioned in the uh, strategic research agenda of the European quantum flagship in 2020. Now in 2021, Euro HPC joint undertaking gave the support for the first hybrid HPC quantum computing infrastructure in Europe. And what was granted was the project HPC QS. 
which uh, Jülich is uh, coordinating. And it's in this project that the uh, quantum simulator of Pascual uh, is integrated in HPC centers. So HPC QS is a project which runs for uh, four years. And it's a project with 15 uh, European uh, partners and three linked third parties. In uh, total, we have six European uh, countries involved. What is the aim of the project? We have two um, supercomputing centers. First of is the Jülich Supercomputing Center. The second one is the uh, Supercomputing Center of CEA in Paris. And both of these supercomputing sites will integrate a quantum simulator of Pascual into their HPC infrastructure. Now, CEA and um, the Jülich Supercomputing Center will also be connected. So already here we have a federated HPC quantum computing infrastructure at the end of the project. This federated infrastructure will again provide access to Euro uh, European uh, users um, in HPC quantum computing. For the integration, there are two main uh, technical components. So the first one is the quantum learning machine by Atos. We use it as a programming environment and it will also be used as a system for direct access to the quantum uh, backend, which is in this case the Pascual simulator. The second component is that we use the modular supercomputing architecture for the integration and this to allow us to have the lowest latency integration of the quantum simulator. Now here uh, we use software that has been developed in a series of EU funded deep projects and it's based on Par Partex Parastation model uh, middleware suite. What are the implementation aspects? So we have to integrate our quantum processing units and its front end into the full management stack of the modular supercomputer. We want to have our uh, low latency connection to other modules because we need connection to the CPUs and the GPUs. And this we do via the federated high speed network that we have. And then of course, this also, this quantum computer or quantum simulator has evidently to be integrated in the scheduling and the resource management and this on the system level. We do not only look into these hardware aspects, we also in the project take care of our users. So we uh, have to develop new usage models. We have to come to tightly coupled simulations and um, we have to think of uh, workflows in which we can use this QPU. So everyone in the room here who's familiar with HPC simulations and if you have workflows, it's very important to start looking into your codes and see, is there maybe a small part that I can give to a quantum computer? You have to be aware, this will not yet be for production, but we have to test it out. It's a learning process. And of course, for the user, it's also good that we come to a unified uh, environment. So we have to take care of user software management, storage, and so on. In the project, we develop a full hybrid software stack. So we will uh, take uh, care that there are technical libraries and tools. The users have to be able to translate their use cases into programs uh, for these uh, hybrid devices without having to deal with the low level uh, instructions. We will develop and use existing uh, compilers and uh, here we focus on these hybrid variational algorithms as the quantum approximate optimization algorithm is one of the examples. 
always important. We look into benchmarking and uh, certification. We have to know what the performance is of our devices. And in this case, we will uh, provide cloud access. How do we provide access for our users? We develop a portal in a form of a quantum simulator platform as a service, and this under European uh, legislation. As a basis, we use what has been developed for our local uh, quantum computer user facility, Unique, and there we make use of the Jupyter Hub technology. Why this we have also for our HPC systems, and it's used by many different uh, communities. Now, if we have already unique as being a first step to Euro QCS since 2019, then now, with the two sites, the one in Paris and the other one uh, in Jülich, in this European project in which we integrate this quantum simulator in the HPC center, we make a second step into the direction of this European uh, infrastructure. Now, recently there was also a an, uh, call and an outcome of a call, and it was announced you might have seen this from the press release, that in Europe there are now, we are starting to build up six other hosting sites, so supercomputing centers that will integrate a quantum computer into their infrastructure. So these six, we have again one in uh, Paris, we have one in Italy, we have one in Spain, one in Poland, one in Czechia, and we have also uh, one in Italy and uh, one, a second one in uh, Germany. So we can say that starting from 2022, we make the third step towards this federated HPC quantum computing infrastructure in Europe. So to summarize, um, in 2019, in the Unix Supercomputing Center, we started with the uh, quantum uh, user infrastructure, Unique, and some characteristics are that it's manufacturer independent, and we want to come to a comprehensive quantum computing user facility. Why? It's not yet known which technology will finally deliver the best quantum computer. There are many questions, scaling, uh, speed, and things like that. So for now, we want to provide our users with a broad variety of quantum technologies. We integrate them in uh, the supercomputers uh, that we have, and then, of course, for the users, uh, we have to see that we provide an easy and affordable peer-reviewed access. We also speak about affordable. These are scientists. We cannot always rely on the commercial access that is provided by uh, the vendors of quantum computers. As I explained, starting from Unique, we have this project, HPCQS, this European project, in which now Two uh, supercomputing uh, sites are involved in the integration of a Pascual quantum simulator. Each will have one. In this project, these are not the only uh, supercomputing infrastructure that are uh, participating. There are others participating, developing the software stack, taking care of use cases, and so on. Now with HPCQS, we created, or we will create, an open and evolutionary infrastructure that aims at expanding in the future by including other types of quantum computers. So these sites, the variety of the quantum computers,
will only grow. And um, the idea is also to integrate then together with other nodes that will now appear in Europe and make out of this, this federated European HPC quantum computing infrastructure. So and with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. All right, so we have some time for questions. Uh, we ask everybody in the room to use one of the uh, microphones uh, that are set up. Uh, while you're making your way there, I'd, uh, I see that we have a few questions that have come in online. So you know, please make your way to the microphones if you're in the room. And meanwhile, the first question is an opinion question. What do you think about classic with the Q? <laughs> classic, uh, does classic make it easier to develop quantum circuits? Is that credible? So are you familiar with uh, classic? Um, to, to draw the, the quantum circuits, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, this is something which is useful for the users. So in, in that sense, these are things which can be integrated in, in this entire software stack that has to be uh, provided to the user. So I would say it's more on the user interface uh, level that this can play a, a role. It's not the only one, but... Okay, so you have been looking at uh, uh, software systems to make it easier for users? Yes, yes, that's uh, very important, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question over here. Was Kittel from ISC Group. Uh, assuming I have a quantum computer with entanglement and I have two qubits and there's an entanglement between the two qubits. Now the theory said that uh, says that uh, if I change one cubic, then immediately the other one will also be uh, changed. But uh, does this not be in contradiction to the speed of light, that no nothing can be faster than the speed of light? Yes, you are talking about a spooky action of a distance. I mean, there is a lot of uh, discussion about these things. So these are the peculiarities of uh, quantum computing. But entanglement is nothing else than a correlation. And correlation, we have this here quantum correlations in the quantum system, but we also have correlations in classical systems. So spooky action at a distance, in, in my opinion, that's very simple that does not exist. I mean, one cannot um, go faster than the speed of light. So, so that's not what the quantum computer is, is working with. Of course, it makes use of entanglement in the sense that, um, and it's important, I've shown you this, um, if one comes to these correlated uh, states, but, um, it, it's not so uh, spooky as you are referring to this. So they are correlated and that's it. Not faster than the speed of light. Quantum computer is, by the way, not calculating faster than the speed of light. For now, it's calculating much slower than the HPC systems. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so let's go to another online question. We'll try to alternate. Um, so I guess referring to the, uh, the, uh, the airplane scheduling example, what are other successful use cases to give researchers ideas of what to try on quantum computers? Um, it depends at, at what kind of uh, quantum computer one is looking at. So for an annealer, uh, there are already different use cases. So um, optimization of uh, traffic, I know of optimization of hotel reservations, um, advertisement, um, in several uh, optimization of financial uh, portfolios, of course, train systems. Um, and one of the uh, hybrid um, 
examples one has there are also optimization problems. So you can think of optimization problems, use a quantum annealer to optimize it and take this outcome as input for a classical optimizer. And there are several examples that show that then the classical optimizer comes to a better result. So in that case, one can use the quantum annealer as a pre-optimizer. So that's one uh, type of example. Then the tail assignment problem is, is here in this case, can be for both. So for the gate-based quantum computer, it can also be for the um, quantum annealer. Is this a use case? I mean, if we do it of, with 42 qubits, it's not even a prototype a use case, I would say. But it's a direction it, in which one uh, could think of. Calculating the ground state energy of a molecule uh, would be another one. And one can think of other uh, optimization problems. In machine learning, classification of imaging, images, it's, it's an, another example. Um, and of course, one has many images in, in medicine, uh, earth observation, and things like that. All right. Um, let's see, I don't see one on that side, so let's go uh, on this side. Uh, thanks for the, uh, the review of the current state of the art. Uh, I would like to uh, have your take on the future going from here. And so what do you think about the scaling of the Rose's law and Naveen's law? And uh, how many qubit are we expecting for the annealer? Is there any way we can harvest the error for something good? And also, uh, you know, what do you think about our future that the uh, uh, you know, optimizing the HPC using quantum annealing? Um, yes, first of all, um, in, in my opinion, a quantum computer will never replace an, a supercomputer, so we will always have our HPC systems. The quantum computer can be an add-on as an uh, accelerator. Then um, you asked about the annealer. Um, for the moment being, the biggest uh, quantum annealers are the ones produced by uh, D-Wave. And from D-Wave we know, and, and this is history, that uh, almost every two years they uh, manage to double the size of their quantum processor. Um, so this means we now have 5, 000, more than 5,000 qubits, the next one, uh, we believe, and also from talking to DWAVE, that the next one will not have this 10,000, but maybe around seven, 8,000. Another thing with the quantum annealer is also the connectivity, and not only with the annealer, also gate-based systems, is the connectivity between the qubits. So for use cases, it's most beneficial if one has all-to-all -all connectivity, and um, we see in these quantum processors from D-Wave, for example, that also the connectivity increases, which means that the prototype use cases that one uh, can use it for are also increasing every uh, two years, so to speak. Not to speak about the quality of the qubits, which is also uh, improved from quantum processor to quantum processor. And we see, um, we can say we see a similar um, evolution for the gate-based systems, although it's, it's a slower uh, evolution. But they are di more difficult, there the qubits are more difficult to control. Uh, so what are the potential for the errors and also storage using quantum? Storage, a uh, quantum compute, uh, quantum storage, you mean, then that's, uh, that's something different. But a quantum computer is not a machine that can deal with big data. So for big data, you will need uh, still your uh, HPC systems. So you have to take the best of both worlds in order to come uh, or to make an advancement in, in computing. 
in, in the uh, practical quantum computing. Okay, so uh, with that, I see that we're uh, uh, right on time uh, at the end of this session. So uh, please uh, thank again uh, Professor Crystal Michelson.